today for participants in Bonn, Toronto, Vienna, and Brussels. WorldNet presents a discussion on the Presidential Commission on the Space Shuttle Challenger Accident. Now, live from our studios in Washington, D.C., here is your moderator, broadcast journalist, Paul Duke. The accident of the Space Shuttle Challenger on January 28th evoked a wave of concern over the future of the U.S. space program. President Reagan demanded, President Reagan demanded an investigation and named an independent commission. Led by former Secretary of State William Rogers, the mandate of the commission was to review all the evidence and other aspects of the accident and to develop recommendations for corrective action. Five months later, the panel issued its report documenting its findings. With me today is Dr. Alton Keel, the Commission's Executive Director, who helped to draft the final report and its recommendations. Welcome to World Net this morning, Dr. Keel. Thank you. The uh, report came out. It received a great deal of attention in this country. But there were some people who felt the Commission's findings did not go far enough, that the report was not tough enough. Well, Paul, I, th I think it was obviously a, a difficult task deciding exactly what the tone of the report should be. But on balance, all of us felt that the first priority, obviously, was to determine what caused this accident and make sure we recommend the corrective actions to avoid any future accident of this nature and, obviously, any future actions of any type. At the same time, it was important, obviously, not to needlessly in any way try to to uh, attack the integrity or, or undermine the, the, uh, the, the integrity of the NASA as an institution. NASA is terribly important to this country, in fact, to the Western world as we see it in terms of its exploration in space. So it's very important that the report be balanced. We didn't see there was any need to actually name names, if you will. Uh, or, in fact, do we support now calling for any indictments or, or persecution? The important thing was establishing what's, what, was, what mistakes were made and, and insisting that those mistakes be corrected and then move on from here in terms of putting the space program back into, into full action. Well, let's move on to our participants this morning and get their questions for uh, a fuller elaboration of the space tragedy in this country. We'll turn now to our participants in Bonn who are standing by with their questions. And I'd like to remind all of the participants this morning to please identify yourselves and your organizations as you ask your first questions. Go ahead, please, Bonn, first question. I'm Jörn Brandt, Federal Ministry for Research and Technology. And I would like to ask Mr. Kiel uh, if he would like to comment on the question if he deems NASA report, NASA's report on the uh, action following the shuttle accident as appropriate and manageable, especially because uh, the, re the report seems to contain scores of activities which uh, might cause a bit of a problem. Well, I, I certainly, NASA has just submitted the report that was alluded to by the questioner this past Monday to the President. The President asked NASA to submit to him within 30 days a report on implementing the Commission recommendations. The, our own interpretation of that report is that it's a fairly faithful uh, attempt to implement the Commission recommendations. In fact, obviously, the design effort is already ongoing on the major recommendation of the Commission to redesign the flawed joint in the solid rocket booster segments. In addition, NASA has already announced and has indicated in the report establishment of a safety office headed by an associate administrator who reports directly to the administrator of NASA, which was another primary recommendation of the commission. It's also indicated by September it's going to establish a, a shuttle advisory safety panel that was called for by the commission. It's already started review of, uh, of the so-called criticality list, that is a list of the most critical elements and components on the shuttle system. That review, in fact, was started before the Commission completed its work, and that is going to be finished prior to the launch of the next shuttle system. The one thing that the report did indicate is that the, the target date of July 1987 for the next shuttle flight 
is now slipped and it now will be sometime after the 1st of 1988. But a lot of the recommendations that the Commission call for, by necessity, NASA has indicated this established task force or task groups to determine exactly what has to be done to implement those. And so the full implementation plan won't be known for some time for all nine Commission recommendations. Now, the other thing that was alluded to by the questioner was, in fact, obviously the Commission did call for a number of, of specific actions to be taken, made up in nine specific recommendations. Obviously, we felt all those recommendations were extremely important. Not all of those have to be completed prior to the next launch. For example, some of the recommendations for the abort system changes, some of the recommendations for the landing system changes, those we anticipate will be ongoing efforts over some period of time. But certainly the most important recommendations that we call for, needless to say, the first one being an obviously redesign of the SRP joint, those have to be completed. That does mean that, that potentially there will be further delays. It does mean there's going to be a little more cost involved. But obviously there's, there is no option in order to put flight safety first and get the shuttle system flying again. My name is Helmut Schütz. I am responsible in, in the German Aerospace Research Organization, DFVLA, in Cologne for safety, reliability, and quality assurance. My question is therefore referring to your recommendation number four. And uh, the first question is the position and the role, the um, um, uh, authority and responsibility of this new office, which is headed by uh, George Rodney, and the second question is referring to the resources uh, of this personnel at NASA. As we have heard from the press and, for example, from Space uh, Daily, that NASA has been made responsible for a cut of this quality assurance personnel to a third in the last 15 years. And my question is now, do you intend to increase this personnel? The, uh, the safety office that's called for in the recommendation for and the commission is referred to by the questioner, as I alluded to, in fact, has been established now. Uh, and it, is, it will be uh, headed by Mr. Rodney, which is a, and he will be an associate administrator for space flight. And he will report directly again to the administrator of NASA, Dr. Fletcher. That office will have authority for safety, reliability, quality assurance for all of NASA activities, not just the Space Shuttle Program, but all activities throughout all the NASA centers. And it will be independent of, as we call for in the Commission recommendation, it will be independent of other NASA activities, such as any program pressures, any schedule pressures, uh, any budget pressures, for that matter. The personnel, in fact, have been cut over the last three or four years within NASA in this area, just as, just as referred to by the questioner. The obvious question is, is a good one. Are, in, are there, in fact, underway now plans to increase the personnel for these areas? The NASA administrator is now talking to the director of what we call in the United States our Office of Personnel mm -hmm. Management. And in fact, they are now vigorously working out arrangements to allow NASA some flexibility to bring on more, more personnel to man these critical areas. Those final arrangements haven't been made, but the obvious answer is that yes, NASA will, one way or the other, be allowed the flexibility to bring those personnel in. All right, thank you, Bon. Uh, very good to get your opening questions. We'll be back to you in a bit. Let's turn next to Toronto. First question, please, from Toronto. This is Grace Nichols, the director of the Center for Research and Experimental Space Science at York University. Before I ask my question, I'd like to say that I personally have the greatest regard for the NASA scientists and engineers with whom I have been working. My question really relates to delays. We recognize the space, station, the space uh, shuttle, the STS, as part of a system which will eventually lead us to space station and beyond. But right now, we do two things with shuttle. It's there for space applications, the launching of satellites and so on, and it's there to do space science. I note in the report comments concerning delays involving the 
manifesting of uh, scientific experiments and so on. Already, it takes almost five years to get an experiment from inception onto shuttle, if you're lucky. It looks as if that will be long um, drawn out. Those of us in the space science community in Canada are very concerned with the length of time taken to use the shuttle as an effective uh, agent to do good space science. Have you any comment on the delays involved in existing projects like, for example, Hubble Space Telescope, um, WAMD, which we have at York University, and your thoughts for the future in that regard? Certainly. I think there are sort of two elements of your, your question. One is what will the obvious consequences be of the fact that we're now in a uh, hiatus, if you will, in, in the United States with respect to launch capability, not just the Space Shuttle, but the, the Delta and the Titan. And that obviously will mean delays in planned space programs. Uh, needless to say, those delays are certainly go are, are simply going to have to be acceptable until we take the steps that are required to get the shuttle flying again. Uh, the other part of your question had to do with, with respect to the normal preparation planning, mission planning for a, for a shuttle launch under normal conditions. Uh, it does take a lot of advanced planning and scheduling. And as a consequence, there has to be uh, a lot of prior work uh, before schedules are made. What the report referred to in its uh, chapter called Pressures on the System was the fact that, that once you set up the schedule long in advance, inevitably you have changes in what, what is called the cargo manifest, which means changes from a number, for a number of reasons, uh, either in the payload, in the mission, in the, in the crew uh, composition. And those changes, as we referred uh, to them in the report, inevitably caused pressures on the system because it, mean that it meant that you had your planning and your, uh, and your training uh, compressed into uh, a much uh, smaller time frame. So uh, our recommendation, in fact, was that there be fewer changes in that cargo manifest once it's established. Now, what that means is, in fact, that there, there is going to have to be this long-range planning for scientific missions, uh, and those plan plans are going to have to be finalized uh, uh, prior to launch, uh, and in fact, uh, to, to the maximum extent possible, those plans are going to have to be adhered to. Steve Strauss from the Globe and Mail newspaper in Toronto. I have uh, two questions. Um, first of all, does the did the Commission have an idea of what would be an acceptable number of um, catastrophic accidents per flight uh, following the uh, approval of the recommendation, if there's one in a thousand or one in ten thousand, is that considered um, engineer in, within engineering terms satisfactory? And two, it seems that the, the notion of um, providing an escape system for the astronauts was dealt with with um, a fair degree of hand-waving, that is the suggestion that NASA should look into this. Uh, an escape system in the first uh, couple of minutes. If NASA comes forward and says we simply can't do it, is that uh, agreeable to the Commission, do you think? Well, I think the, the obvious question, without trying to deal with the question uh, too cavalierly with respect to what's acceptable number of, of catastrophes, I mean, the obvious answer is none. None are acceptable. But to be more specific, did the Commission actually determine what a probability of failure was, whether it was one in 100,000 or one in 1,000? No, we did not. There is an appendix that's going to be published, uh, hopefully, within the next uh, week to 10 days when the final four volumes of the report are, are published. That was uh, the work of Dr. Feynman, who was a member of the Commission, of course. He does in his own personal efforts, uh, review the, the probability analysis that NASA did. And his own deductions are that the 1 in 100,000 estimate uh, was too optimistic. And I think most NASA officials, if not all NASA officials, will agree with that now. But what the number is, we certainly didn't determine, and, there's, and, and uh, nor has NASA indicated any other, any other probability estimates. But obviously, no accident is acceptable from a uh, from a strict uh, standpoint. But we all recognize that risk with respect to space flight, as we say in the report, cannot be totally 
eliminated. With respect to your second question on escape systems, uh, I, I understand the spirit of your question with respect to the appearance of perhaps we treated it in a hand-waving fashion. Uh, let me try to set the framework for that. First, as Paul indicated in the introduction of the program, the mandate of the Commission really was to decide what was the cause of this accident, probable cause or causes, and then determine what corrective action should be taken based on the Commission's determinations and findings. So it wasn't really a broad mandate to go and review all shuttle systems uh, or even operational procedures for that matter, but obviously the Commission took, uh, let the investigation take it where it, where it may, and in addition had specific safety concerns brought to it, uh, for example, by the astronaut office, which led us to make recommendations outside the strict mandate of the Commission. So we were a little bit outside the mandate when we went uh, uh, so far as to make abort system recommendations for, uh, for this accident. But specifically, the recommendations that were made were, number one, that uh, and there were some specific recommendations made, that number one, that for controlled glided flight, that there ought to be uh, improvements made for crew egress. And that was a specific recommendation. In addition, that NASA ought to develop means of using emergency landing sites when more than one engine fails. Uh, they only really have that option now for, for one engine failing. And we think there are some software changes that involve avionics that, uh, that can be done. But with respect to the critical ascent phase, the first two minutes of launch when the solid rocket boosters are firing, our basic conclusion was that obviously for this accident there was no option. There was uh, nothing that could have been done. The crew had no warning, uh, and uh, and if it did have, uh, if it had had warnings, there was really nothing that could have been done. In addition, we concluded that that there there don't appear to be any practical systems, uh, realistic systems, uh, within obvious constraints of of payload and to some degree cost, but principally payload, that could be developed for that critical first two minutes of, of launch. Uh, that's our, our conclusion based on just our peripheral look at that. But we did go so far as to ask NASA to, to, to look into that further and, and to investigate the developing technologies that might be applied. But it's a very complex problem, as I'm sure the, the, the questioner realizes. But our basic conclusion, again, to, to reiterate, is that there don't, there's not appear to be uh, in existence, certainly, uh, and within uh, the, the, uh, the near future, a practical system that might be applied for escape during that first two minutes of launch. Yes, my name is Ross Tennyson. I'm with the University of Toronto Institute for Aerospace Studies. Dr. Steele, do you foresee the possibility of an intermediate design fix that would or hopefully satisfy safety requirements that might indeed lead to earlier launchings of the shuttle? I, I think the answer to that is no. Uh, and I think that's because, frankly, the design fix they're looking at now, and NASA briefed the press on, on a, the, the 2nd of July on its, the status of its design effort, design fix it's looking at now could be called an interim fix. It's basically a redesign of that joint as opposed to a new design. It involves a so-called capture feature that's intended to, to decrease the rotation of that joint and involves taking out the zinc chromate putty that's been used as a thermal barrier. So that really is, in, I think, in, uh, in uh, most minds, uh, a, an intermediate design. It's, it's about the simplest thing one can, do, one can do to that design is still use existing hardware and so forth. And even that design, NASA has now determined that the certification of it is going to uh, require a delay of that July 1987 time frame. I don't think there's any other fix, uh, perhaps quick fix to use the vernacular, that would be considered. It's simp the risk simply isn't acceptable in terms of flight safety. Thank you, Toronto. Next, we go to Vienna. First question, please, from Vienna. I'm Roland Makhachke from Aus 
Austrian radio and television. So I've got two questions. The first one, very short, just to clear up a point. Dr. Kiel, yours is the only signature missing in the presentation of the report. Does that mean anything? Uh, that what that means, quite simply, is that I, I really was not a commissioner. I was the executive director of the commission. And as, uh, and as, consequence, uh, as a consequence, I really wasn't required to, to, uh, to sign the report. Or moreover, it really wasn't appropriate that I ever sign the report. The commission did decide early on uh, that I should be a full participant in the commission hearings. And as a consequence, I was as executive director. But I did not. Uh, I, I did not sign the report. I, I, that does not mean I don't concur with it, however, because I do. Thank you. Now my second question. It is quite apparent that the commission found a number of false mistakes, flaws, and so on, not only concerning the launch of the 51L mission, but down to basic design and management questions of both NASA and some of the NASA contractors. But it is also evident from the report that no single individual, nor even a group of individuals, for example, the SRB officer at Marshall, gets blamed for the accident. The recommendations of the Commission, on the other hand, are quite extensive. Do you think that these recommendations can be put to task with the same persons in charge who were responsible for the flaws in design and decisions right from the beginning of the shuttle program? Well, as, as I referred to, uh, very briefly previously, the, the Commission really didn't think it was appropriate to name individuals uh, or, or uh, groups of individuals, if you will, to, to uh, assess blame. That, in fact, assessing blame really wasn't our, our responsibility. What our responsibility was was to determine where the mistakes were and to point out that, that in fact, they had to be corrected. It's certainly a legitimate question that one can ask, at least rhetorically, can those mistakes be corrected with the same individuals involved? I think that's something that NASA has to, to wrestle with, and I think it's something that NASA is wrestling with. We did indicate under our recommendation with respect to improving communications within NASA, that is a transfer of information on problems, problem reporting, problems, problem trends, that uh, that's specifically there appeared to be a, a trend within the Marshall Space Flight Center out of the NASA centers uh, to uh, withhold information, uh, not in a, any, uh, uh, any uh, intentional way of, of, of uh, not keeping people informed, but more on the basis of they felt they could solve their own problems. And we did point that out, and we pointed out that changes had to be made there, whether they were of a personnel nature, or whether they were or, or reorganization nature, or whether they were or in the form of in re-indoctrination, if you will. So we did go so far as to make that kind of general recommendation, but we again didn't feel it was appropriate to name individuals or or uh, uh, suggest changes on an individual basis. I, I will point out the obvious, as I, and I'm sure the questioner must be aware of this, that uh, since the commission. Uh, in fact, has finished its work. In fact, even during the time the Commission was doing its work, a number of personnel changes have already been made, either on a voluntary basis or on uh, the basis of NASA taking action. My name is Johannes Ortner, and I'm the managing director of the Austrian Solar and Space Agency. I had the chance to meet uh, Mr. Fletcher last week in Paris when the delegations to the Council of the European Space Agency were invited to discuss the future of the space program and of the United States space program with him. As you may know, Austria will become a full member of the European Space Agency from 1st January next year, and we also participate in the so-called Columbus program, which is the European part of the space station program. Now my concern is rather the future, the future of the shuttle flights and uh, the construction of the space station. And uh, with discussions of Mr. Fletcher, we were left afterwards with, with some afterthoughts. And I would just like to ask you what your opinion would be in the construction of the space station 
if you just have three orbiters available, because we were told that the first priority in the future is given to have the space station ready in 1992. I think there's some bias towards the 500 years anniversary of the discovery of the United States by Christopher Columbus. And uh, we have a feeling that uh, it will be quite tough if you uh, don't really think on constructing a fourth orbiter. There's also the question, what would happen if a, uh, this another orbiter would fail? Now, I, we understood that with three orbiters, you have uh, 12 to 15 flights per year, realistically. And with four orbiters, maybe 16 to 20 flights per year, not as before as there were two, 24 flights per year foreseen. I understand that to construct the space station, we need 16 to 20 flights of shuttle. And therefore, my question to you is how do you see it uh, if it is really realistic to have the space station operational in 1992? Well, it, I think uh, there, there are two parts of, uh, of your question. One is, do you need four orbiters to actually go ahead with the space program? I think the answer to that is no. Uh, the other part of your question, which is the, the way you phrase the question at the end, uh, is can we still make the 1992 date with four orbiters? Now, that might be difficult. I think that certainly is a, is a legitimate concern uh, if, you only have, if you only had three orbiters as opposed to four. In fact, Dr. Fletcher has, has essentially responded to, the, to that question in, in exactly that way, that the four orbiters aren't needed in order to continue the space program. And with or without the fourth orbiter, the United States will continue the, to continue the space station program but that without a fourth orbiter, there may be some delay. And I think that's exactly the, the best assessment we can give now is that there, there may be some delay. But I think it's fair to say, and I'm sure the, the, that you know based on your own experience, that there may be some delay even with fourth orbiters on getting, to, uh, getting a space station up and operating by 1992, that inherently technically complex and, de and demanding development uh, programs uh, do lead to delays. For example, the space, space uh, shuttle itself, excuse me, was delayed two years uh, from the original uh, planned uh, uh, first flight of the, of the shuttle program. So I think, uh, to be fair, you can, there may be some delay even with fourth orbiter, four uh, orbiters in the space station, uh, but uh, that uh, the that the fourth orbiter isn't a, 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 a absolute requirement in order to continue the space station, and the U.S. will continue with or without that fourth orbiter. Now, I uh, let me make one other comment on some of the data that you indicated. That, namely, perhaps we could do 12 to 15 launches with three orbiters and 16 to 20 with four. I'm not confident of, of any of those numbers at this point. I don't think NASA is either. It's very clear, as the Commission report indicates, that, in fact, with nine launches in 1985, with four orbiters, the system was pretty well stressed. And so without some of the corrective actions that we've indicated in the report, uh, the notion of getting 12 to 15 with three is probably a little out of reach, as, as is 16 to 20 with four, perhaps. But there has to be a lot of streamlining and standardization, if you will, which costs money and takes time and planning before those goals can be reached. So I think that, again, that simply leads back to the, to the, to the obvious, and, and that is that there, there's some prospect for delay. There may be delay uh, with, uh, with or without the fourth orbiter in terms of putting the space station up by 1992. supplementary question, did any one of you think about uh, the possibility that you could lose another orbiter and you would be left with two? Of course, we pray and hope for you that it would not happen, but what, what would happen if it appears? No, of, of course, that's one of the considerations in making the decision of, to go to the fourth orbiter. Uh, let me just make it clear, I'm sure it's, it's well known, but the Commission didn't make any recommendation on a fourth orbiter. It felt it was outside our charter. And hence, uh, there's, there's no recommendation of the Commission report with respect to uh, 
uh, purchasing that fourth orbiter. The administration is now, the White House is considering that question. And in fact, uh, perhaps as, as soon as the next week or two, we'll, we'll make a decision or make a recommendation at least to the president. But uh, certainly one of the considerations amongst a number, as I'm sure the questioner knows, in determining whether or not the proper decision, the proper use of resources, that's really the question, uh, is to purchase a fourth orbiter, is the prospect of losing, uh, certainly, God forbid, a, another orbiter. All right, thank you, uh, Vienna. Please stand by. Our final stop now is Brussels. Please go ahead, Brussels. My name is Paul De Vos from a daily newspaper, La Libre Belgique. My question is, uh, for your new boosters, you will, uh, will you keep liquid or solid uh, propagol, or uh, will you test it vertically? First, the, the, uh, the booster really is not going to be a new booster. It, as NASA now envisions it, it's simply going to be a redesign of the joint between the segments of the solid rocket booster that's, that has, uh, has been used. And in fact, it will use, for the most part, existing hardware. It will require some new uh, machining and some new uh, forging of the segments in the joint area, the so-called uh, uh, for the so-called Tang and Clevis joint, but it still will be the same solid rocket booster design, and of course, it'll still be a, a solid rocket. Uh, so, so uh, that uh, that will not be a a uh, liquid rocket. Now, I've I've lost track of the second part of the questioner's question. Would you? Would you please repeat the uh, second part of your question, please? Will you test it vertically? Yes. Yes. Uh, the the <coughs> commission recommended that, uh, uh, in, the com in the words of the commission, that full consideration be given to testing the redesign in a vertical position and as near to the flight configuration uh, as possible. Uh, NASA really hasn't decided finally whether that uh, can be done, whether it's practical or not. There currently is no existing vertical test stand to do that, uh, but there are some perhaps innovative ways to do it in the absence of a, of a test stand, or one in fact could, in, could build a, uh, a test stand for a relatively modest sum of money compared to what it's going to take to to continue the U.S. space program, that is, perhaps 10 or 20 million dollars compared to the three to eight billion dollar investment to to uh, restore the U.S. space program. So that decision is still under consideration. The commission didn't didn't make it a specific recommendation. It simply said that full consideration ought to be given. We still have some time left, and with that time, uh, we'd like to return to our participants for follow-up questions. So we'll begin now with uh, uh, another question from Brussels. I am Theo Pirar for the Daily News Vers l'Avenir. Oh, did I? I have two questions. Your commission has discussed the concept of the space shuttle. Is this concept really the best one? Or if you prefer, can the shuttle become a completely reliable machine? Or is it not urgent to look for another type of space plane now? Well, again, the, the mandate of the commission wasn't to go in and completely reassess this, the space shuttle system or evaluate it or even determine the overall risk of the space shuttle system. That was, was clearly we didn't have the resources or the time to do that. Uh, our charter, again, was determined the cause of this accident. Needless to say, in the course of the investigation, uh, questions did come up, uh, and the commission was, was made aware of, uh, of considerations that, uh, that uh, that are part of what the questioner has asked here in terms of is the space shuttle system the best concept. But that was outside our, our charter and so we made no recommendations there. The, uh, again, the, the administration as it's considering 
uh, where to go from here, if you will, in terms of putting the space, the U.S. space program, back on uh, sound footing, uh, is is taking into account to some degree those kinds of questions because it does mean a large investment, as I mentioned before, something in the range of three billion, three billion to eight billion dollars. So part of what the administration has to to address in, in answering that question is where do, where, do, where do we transition to in our space program? What comes after the space shuttle? Because it is a significant investment, if you will, in sort of a midterm uh, time frame in terms of the, the life of the shuttle. So I'm, the administration is wrestling with that, and that's an appropriate question for them to consider in, in their deliberations for making that, that decision. Uh, but uh, the only other comment I would make is that obviously the in addition to the U.S. space station effort and the cooperation with, with Europeans in the space station effort, the U.S. has, has in fact uh, initiated a development of an aerospace plane, uh, the so-called Orient, uh, Orient Express. So there is some commitment on a long-term basis to a new space plane. Yes, uh, Tina Pisco on behalf of RTL Television. Uh, could you comment on the setback in the U.S. space program in view of the Soviet Union's continuing commitment to space? How badly will the U.S. be lagging behind in the next decade? Well, well needless to say, it is some setback in terms of, of not being able to get uh, payloads uh, into orbit and, in fact, having essentially no, uh, no medium or, or heavy launch uh, capability now. Uh, it, it's not as much of a setback, frankly, in my view, as has been portrayed by some, including Jane's. I don't think the, I don't think the, the Soviet Union is 10 years ahead of the, of the U.S. in uh, space exploration. Uh, you, the only way you can come to that conclusion is by looking at some, some fairly rough uh, 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 indicators, if you will, such as total number of launches and total time in uh, in orbit. I think you have to look beyond that and look at systems and system capabilities. After all, the Soviet Union is now developing a space shuttle system. We already have one in operation and have taken, obviously, some lumps, if you will, with respect to this accident. But we're going to learn from that, and I think the shuttle system is going to be even better when we get it back up and operating. So there is some setback, but I think it's only an interim basis, and it means the, the greatest effect of it is delay in launching critical uh, payloads in the orbit, and, and that backlog is growing, and that's a concern. But I think it's something that's, that uh, uh, obviously is going to have to be accepted under the circumstances, but I think it's something that, that uh, we can clearly recover from. Uh, thank you. I had a, a follow-up question. Uh, in view of the setback, and you were mentioning uh, before that eventually the launching schedule had been a little bit too, uh, too heavy at the time. Isn't it inevitable that uh, part of the market for launching satellites is going to go to unmanned launchers, either like Ariane or to private companies? Could you comment on that? Well, I think uh, the, the answer is, of course, yes. In fact, part of the uh, commission recommendation was, or commission recommendations was, that uh, it had been a mistake to, for the U.S. to rely so heavily on one launch capability, namely the shuttle launch, and that shouldn't be done in the future, meaning that you ought to have more than one launch capability. The obvious option, and in fact the one the, the U.S. has already committed to, is the so-called expendable launch vehicles or, in other words, unmanned uh, or, in the case of Dr. Sally Rod, unwomaned uh, vehicles. So. Uh, the U.S., in fact, is going to make more use of unmanned vehicles or expendable launch vehicles. That decision actually was made 18 uh, months to two years ago when the U.S. committed to, committed to uh, purchasing more expendable launch vehicles. And now that uh, decision has been reinforced by this accident, and uh, both NASA and uh, the US, uh, U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Department of Defense, support that, as obviously, of course, as does uh, the President. And that's consistent with the commission recommendations. So, yes, more launches are going to go to unmanned vehicles. They're going to go to unmanned U.S. vehicles. I think another consequence will be 
uh, that you may see some further development of, of a commercial U.S. Uh, space launch capability. I, I think overall that's good. Uh, my own view is that uh, President Mitterrand uh, had, a, uh, had a, uh, a useful suggestion when he was in the U.S. for our Independence Day celebrations and the 100-year anniversary of, our, of the Statue of Liberty, when he suggested that the Europeans and the U.S. sit down and look at the future of space launch capability where uh, this, uh, this window, if you will, uh, regrettable as, as it is, where there have been a number of incidents, obviously, with U.S. systems, but also with the French systems, offers an opportunity for all of us to sit down and perhaps have some discussions on where the Western world wants to go with space launch capability. I think that's probably a, 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 a noteworthy uh, recommendation. Thank you, Brussels. Let's get more follow-up questions now. And at this point, let's return to Bon. Go ahead, please, Bon. Uh, this is Wolfgang Priester, the director of the Institute for Astrophysics and Space Research at Bonn University. My question concerns the schedule for the next missions in space science, in astrophysics in particular. Taking that the new missions will be resumed, uh, let's say, in February 88, is there already a schedule, even in a preliminary form, at what times the next space science missions will be launched, like the Hubble Space Telescope or Ulysses going into high ecliptic latitudes, or even Galileo going to Jupiter. Particularly, the Hubble Space Telescope will be of major importance for basic science, even attacking those important questions like the origin of matter in the universe. And uh, thus, we are very eager for our own schedules here, for our own participation in the, obs the observations with the Hubble Space Telescope, to get an idea at what times we really can expect that uh, Hubble goes into orbit? Well, the, uh, there may be a, such a preliminary schedule, preliminary schedule uh, way down in the NASA system, if you will, uh, but uh, there's, there, is, there is not any such schedule that has anything near any, any official uh, standing. What Admiral Truly, who is the Associate Administrator for Space Flight for NASA, has indicated, and properly so, is that the next launch will be a conservative launch. It will have a payload, a payload similar to, uh, to payloads that have been carried before. There will be no new payloads introduced. And the next several launch will be uh, basically uh, uh, adhering to that philosophy. So it is a little premature to indicate exactly when specific scientific ex experiments and payloads are going to be launched. Uh, as I said, I'm sure there's some consideration uh, of a very tentative nature being given down in the lower levels within the NASA uh, agency, uh, but they certainly uh, haven't been made public and they certainly aren't official. This is Stephen Strauss from the Globe and Mail. Um, I'd like to ask a question of, uh, I guess, uh, your psychological uh, evaluation. If a shuttle experienced a catastrophic disaster in, say, 10 flights, is that it for the shuttle? Does it have to be safe for a certain number of flights in order to get over this trauma? And question number two has to do with the, the tension between uh, research and um, the commercialization, and this is not just for the shuttle, but uh, for the space station, isn't hasn't NASA built in, or hasn't the the U.S. built in this tension inherently, and and won't one continually face uh, issues of having to get the uh, the payload up and pressures on the part of people who want it up in a certain time frame? And if this is part of the problem, isn't this this won't this be a continuing part of the problem? Well, obviously, the to answer your first question would be quite speculative. Uh, I can only say that, needless to say, one of our greatest concerns is that, is that there would be another accident, not just from the standpoint, uh, and obviously, uh, of the, the tragedy of, with respect to the human loss. But certainly, I think one can reasonably conclude that there, if there is another failure, whether it's in the next 10 flights or the next five flights or even the next 20 flights, that it is going to be a trauma with respect to uh, the U.S. space program. 
uh, and and whether or not uh, the the shuttle system per se could recover from that is is uh, I think is certainly open to question. The your second point I think is is certainly a valid point, and again it's something that's treated I, and I'm sure you you're aware of it treated very uh, thoroughly uh, in the in the report, and that is that that yes in in establishing the shuttle system as, quote, operational, unquote, and uh, presenting it as routine uh, and that the first priority is to make it uh, cost effective did inevitably put a sort of relentless pressure on the system. Our recommendation is that that can't be done, that the shuttle system is, in fact, still a developmental program and will be by its very nature of having a few, few vehicles and really a few number of flights on the scale of any other uh, aircraft developmental program. So it will always be developmental in that sense. And hence, that there have to be special precautions taken, uh, special uh, measures made uh, to assure flight safety first. So our recommendation is that that's what has to be done, and the, and the embodiment of our recommendation, for the most part, addresses that. So in answer to your question, isn't it inevitable that, that uh, in fact, there will always be that pressure? I, th I say no, that if you take the kind of steps we've recommended, we pointed out that that was a mistake and there were pressures. But if you take the kind of, kind of steps that we've recommended, uh, you can't avoid that, those pressures in, in our view. from Austrian Radio and Television in Vienna. Uh, Dr. Kiel, will the blame NASA had to take for the Challenger accident revive an old discussion, private enterprise versus national enterprise? Could you, for instance, foresee that space business will be taken away from NASA and be given to the private sector, with NASA remaining only as a space science agency? And uh, question number two, you were talking about expendable boosters. What would that mean in terms of payload design? Because many satellites have been constructed and designed for the specifications of the shuttle payload bay. Yes, uh, t two very, very uh, pertinent questions. I think that, that one consequence, uh, again, of the recommendation that we've made in the report is that we shouldn't rely on one system, a consequence of going to more expendable launch vehicles, uh, that, in fact, will make it more attractive for commercial launch capability. So I think that, that there needn't be a struggle. Our view is there ought to be that kind of trade-off, and our view is that if, that if, in fact, the shuttle system is operated as a research and development system, not meaning that it doesn't take commercial payloads, because it will, but if it's operated with, with the thought that flight safety has to be first, then there's going to be more than enough demand uh, in terms of uh, for launch capability uh, than, than the shuttle uh, to provide for or support uh, both a shuttle system as well as uh, expendable launch vehicles as well as some commercial uh, launch capability. So I don't see it as a conflict or a competition. It has been in the past uh, uh, to a degree uh, due in part to the overemphasis perhaps of, of the, uh, the shuttle system being uh, uh, being a routine and cost-effective system. But I think in the future, with the proper emphasis, uh, it'll be more of a complementary basis than a, than a competitive basis. Now, your, your point, again, is a, is a valid one in the question you raised. Obviously, since we've been relying in the U.S. on the shuttle launch uh, capability, a number of our cargoes, most of our car cargoes, in fact, have been uh, built, designed, and, of course, the integration that, that between the payload and the, and the vehicle uh, has been uh, to shuttle specifications. So as a consequence, there are going to be some payloads where there's going to have to, where they simply are going to be limited to the shuttle system because there's no other options. There are going to be some payloads where some, uh, some rework has to be done and where that's cost effective, that will be done. Uh, so, but there are still payloads which are compatible with both a Titan class, for example, expendable launch vehicle, as well as a shuttle system. Yes, to you, Pira, Daily News, Berlavni. Asked you commission to continue his work, and how long? And 
the second question, do you have an estimate concerning the cost to recover the space shuttle safety? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't get the second part of your question. Could you repeat that? Do you have an estimate concerning the cost to complete the test for the, for the modification of the space shuttle? Complete the test yes. for the modification of the space shuttle. Right. Thank you. Uh, the first question with respect to when does the commission go out of business uh, soon, I hope. The, uh, the commission's mandate, was to re which it met, was to report to the president on the 6th of June. And, of course, that uh, final report has been uh, submitted to the, to the president. Uh, the commissioners uh, have, have essentially been released. Uh, I'm still there uh, finishing up publishing the remaining four volumes of the report, which are supporting documents to the, to the, uh, to the main commission report. And I have a core staff that's there. Uh, we, uh, according to the executive order, will go out of business by, uh, uh, by August the 3rd, if you will. And I think we're going to make that date. Uh, right now, it looks like uh, end of this week or early next week that we'll have these final four volumes to the printer and hopefully we'll have them published in another week. So uh, early August, the commission will, uh, including its staff and executive director, uh, will be out of business. Uh, with respect to the specific cost to complete the testing and redesign effort of, uh, of the solid rocket booster, it's, uh, the, the final cost hasn't been determined, of course, and won't be until uh, the, uh, we get a little further along in the, in the redesign effort. But the estimate simply for the redesign effort uh, of the solid rocket boosters alone, not talking about redoing the brake systems or any abort systems uh, or anything of, of that nature, uh, is going to be on the order of a, of a half a billion dollars, uh, $500 million. Uh, and I think that that estimate will probably hold up uh, certainly within 20% uh, uh, within, uh, or so. Friedrich Bola, I'm project manager, uh, oh, sorry, I'm product assurance manager in uh, the German Aerospace Research Establishment. Um, I learned from your presentation that a probability analysis had been prepared recently. I have the following questions. Does this uh, analysis uh, cover only the uh, uh, recent design or will it also uh, have uh, calculation figures for the redesigned subsystems? And second question, will this paper uh, be available for distribution? Yeah, it, uh, perhaps in my previous remarks I, I uh, misled the, uh, the viewers with respect to the sophistication of this probability analysis. It actually was a treatment by Dr. Feynman, as I referred to before, but it basically was simply going back and l reviewing, if you will, the kind of probability analysis that NASA had, had done in establishing reliability of the shuttle system. And that uh, review, uh, as opposed to a new analysis, if you will, uh, is being published as part of our appendices. So we expect that to be published uh, within about the next uh, week to 10-day ten, uh, ten uh, time frame. But it's not a new probability analysis. It's simply a review of the analysis that NASA had done in establishing reliability of the shuttle system. We now have time for one more short question. And also, I must ask a, a short answer from you, Dr. Keel. And we'll take the question from Toronto. Philippe Lap Limited. I wonder if you'd be prepared to hazard a guess as to when NASA will be in a position to officially announce its new schedule for the revised uh, space program. Well, it's, it's already intimated uh, just this past Monday that as far as the next flight, that the original target date for July 1987, uh, in, in the view of NASA, is no longer achievable. 
and that the, the uh, most likely date will be after the, the first of the year 1988. Now, that's, there's been some indication much earlier in testimony of what the number of launches might be for the first 12 months uh, of, of, uh, of flight after the initial flight and then for the next 12 months and so on and so forth. But those are, were, were terribly speculative, and I don't think NASA really uh, wants to be helped by those at this point. So I, so I think the only thing we can say now is that the first launch is going to be after the first of the year, 1988, January, February time frame. That's probably a, 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 uh, a reasonably uh, a doable uh, goal, and that uh, it uh, that uh, from a conservative basis that we shouldn't expect uh, uh, perhaps more than four to six launches the first year, uh, and uh, that uh, the, the the increase is probably going to be conservative in terms of number of launches after that. But but that's only my own uh, uh, personal view, having been having spent the past five months of intensively involved in the shuttle system, but as I said previously, NASA really and, and appropriately hasn't committed to any specific uh, launch schedule. Well, our schedule of time is up for today. Uh, that time always arrives. I want to thank you for a most enlightening presentation this morning on WorldNet, Dr. Keel. I'm Paul Duke for WorldNet in Washington.